Okay, good afternoon, folks. Um, I want to welcome you to the latest in our ENO Center for Transportation webinars. My name is Robert Puentes. I'm the president and CEO of ENO. And I want to thank you for joining us today. Today, we will present a rapid response webinar on transportation at the ballot box. We're going to look at how transportation fared in yesterday's midterm vote, both in terms of the, uh, the elected officials and individuals who are voted in and how the changes, particularly in the House, might play out in terms of transportation-related committees and so forth. Um, we'll also look at how transportation-related ballot measures fared um, in front of voters yesterday. Joining me here at ENO is Jeff Davis, Senior Fellow and Editor of ENO Transportation Weekly. Uh, Jeff and Alex Laska, who co-edits uh, ENO Transportation Weekly, were up all night. Did you sleep at all? Yeah, about two hours. Slept a little bit. Um, we'll have about 30 minutes for the webinar. So the plan is for Jeff to start out with a couple of comments uh, on the political side, and then I'll discuss what we know so far about the ballot measures. A lot of this stuff is coming in uh, in real time. So the, um, we'll give you the latest on that and then we will take your questions and comments. Please use the questions function on the webinar website to submit. You don't have to wait until the end to submit questions. You can submit them anytime during the webinar. I wanna thank you all again for taking the time to join us today. And with that, take it away, Jeff. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, let's see. First of all, you know, you've seen the headlines. Democrats have taken control of the House of Representatives as of January 3rd, 2019. Uh, there's still uh, almost, you know, 18 to 25 uh, races still being counted or haven't been called yet. So the the Democrats are going to wind up with some a, a majority. They're going to have somewhere around the 225 to 235 seats in the House. Uh, 218 is the minimum you need for a majority is the magic number. So it's a governing majority. It's a little less than the Republicans had this year, which is 240, but uh, it's still enough to get things done with party loyalty. Now, the, the question is that uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez has been saying that she's trying to form a sort of a rump progressive caucus that'll do for the Democrats what the so-called Freedom Caucus did for Republicans for the last two years, which is vote no on legislation or, or vote no on the measures or motion to bring up legislation unless it's as ideologically pure as possible. So 225, 235 is not enough to get out of that jam necessarily if that comes to fruition. But uh, it was a very good night for Democrats overall. Uh, no incumbent Democrats anywhere lost. They did lose two or they lost uh, three open seats, I think, but that was netted out, more than netted out by the number of open seats that, Republican, that the Democrats picked up. Uh, a bunch of incumbent Republicans lost, including Kaufman, Curbelo, Blum, Young from Iowa, not Alaska. Mr. Young from Alaska squeaked by again. Uh, Alaska's very difficult to poll, so no one should bother looking at what's happening in Alaska until the votes start coming in. Uh, Yoder, Lewis from Minnesota, who's on TNI, uh, Paulson, Lance, Donovan, Faso from New York is also on TNI, Tenney, Russell from Oklahoma was the big surprise of the night that no one saw coming. Uh, Rothfuss from Pennsylvania. Culberson, uh, who's an appropriations cardinal from Texas. House Rules Committee Chairman Jeff Sessions. We kind of saw that coming, from, but uh, that was the biggest uh, uh, name that lost last night. Uh, Dave Bratton and the D.C. area's own Barbara Comstock. Uh, so that, but there may be a few others that, that lose. Um, notable races that were still undecided when I got in the car to come over here were uh, House Railroad Subcommittee Chairman Jeff Denham, who was up by 1,287 votes but hadn't been pronounced. And uh, TNI and also House Rules Committee and Budget Committee member Rob Woodall, uh, who was up by about 3,700 votes. The big factors that caused this were, you know, POTUS's unpopularity in swing districts, but also looking at it regionally, the tax bill, getting rid of the, of the state and local tax deduction or capping it for people who live in high state income tax, local income tax and property tax states was devastating in a lot of places. And, uh, the Pennsylvania court ruling that ordered a new district map was very important in this as well. Um, this is a chart that just shows you how many seats the Democrats have had starting each Congress, going back to the time they took over in Eisenhower in 1954. And you can see I've got a couple of little lines there at the end that show the range of where they could wind up. And while it is a majority, it's not really the kind, nearly the kind of majority they had in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, going into the 90s before they lost the first time. So that sort of puts their majority they're going to have in a, histo in a, in a historical context. Uh, in the House, uh, Peter DeFazio is going to chair the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Uh, if Jeff Denham wins, he's going to compete against Sam Graves from Missouri for T&I ranking member. The thought going into this election was that if Republicans kept the House, Graves was the favorite because he could be a more insidery productive legislator 
But if the Republicans lost the House, they were looking for someone to do a little more noise making, and that would be more Denim. So if Denim wins, you know, if that thinking was right, that he might have an advantage in this race. But who knows? It's all inside closed door secret ballot baseball stuff. Uh, POTUS has already called Speaker Presumptive Pelosi to uh, congratulate her. And uh, Steny Hoyer has already announced his candidacy for majority leader. But none of these Democratic leaders' uh, elections are kind of locked in yet. There's a, a strong sentiment in, in, in the base of the caucus that it's time for some new blood. Uh, we'll, we'll know more in a couple of weeks when they have the organizational meetings. On the Senate side, yes, Republicans maintain control of the Senate. Uh, they Going into yesterday, we held, they held 51 seats. They got a net gain of two in races called so far. They picked up Indiana, Missouri, and North Dakota. They lost Nevada. So that, that came of uh, three, actually, I think. Uh, but the Republican seat in Miss, you know, I, I did this on two hours sleep. Uh, the Republican held seat in Mississippi, Cindy Hyde Smith, is currently off the board because no one got more than 50%. So she and Mike Espy are going to a runoff in late November. So you take that off the board for a minute. Arizona, the McCain open seat, and Florida, but Senator Nelson, are still counting. Um, this chart shows you where the uh, Senate races were. So, you know, they, they, they net up, they they could go as high as 55 seats, depending on how the two recounts and the Mississippi runoff go. It'll probably be 54 or 55, I think. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, in Arizona, Martha McSally, the Republicans, up by almost 16,000 votes right now. There's 450,000 or so as of this afternoon still to be counted, mostly Maricopa County. Uh, they think that you know, depending on whether those are more early ballot or election day ballots, it depends on whether they people think that uh, Kristen Sinema or McSally would have a slight edge. But I think McSally was stronger in Maricopa than she was in a lot of other big counties in Arizona. So she's still, you know, tentatively a little favored, but there's a, a lot of counting left to go. In Florida, the margin right now is about four tenths of a percentage point for Rick Scott, the Republican, and that falls under the 0.5 percent. Uh, margin for a mandatory machine recount, but Scott's ahead by about 34,500 votes. And as some of you may recall, there was a very, very big recount in Florida 18 years ago. And uh, just for for perspective, uh, the machine recount changed 1,400 votes statewide uh, in that instance. And then all the other court ordered recounting, had they gone forward, may have changed the media the later recounted said 2000 more or so net depending on which kind of dangling chad scenario you used so the machine recount and any subsequent recounts would have to be at 10 times or an order of magnitude more you know bigger this time for senator nelson to hold on so you know 30 34000 is a whole lot even even with 8 million 8.1 million votes cast that's a whole lot to think that could change in a recount and in Mississippi, the Republicans are almost certain to win that runoff. Uh, Cindy Hyde Smith uh, got one like 41 and a half, and Mike Espy got about 40. But uh, another Republican, McDaniel, got 16.4 percent. And McDaniel's one of the guys who thought that Hyde Smith was too establishment, not conservative enough, not Trumpy enough. And so when when he now he's eliminated, do you really think that 16.4 percent of the Mississippi electorate? would then vote for Mike Espy, who was in the Clinton cabinet, who had some ethical issues the Supreme Court had to resolve by basically making it a lot harder to prove quid pro quo and bribery, et cetera, et cetera. Probably not. So the Mississippi Republican would be heavily favored in the uh, runoff seat there. Um, on specifics, uh, it looks pretty obvious that, that Chuck Grassley didn't really have an enjoyable last few months chairing the Judiciary Committee running judges through. And since Orrin Hatch has retired, uh, he can go back and chair the finance committee for two more years if he wants, you know, great for ethanol. Uh, he'll probably do so. Um, there's going to be complete turnover, assuming that Florida stays where it is on uh, the Commerce and Science and Transportation Committee. Uh, John Thune, uh, John Cornyn from Texas, is, his six years are up as the Republican whip. Uh, John Thune wants that and is very favored to get it. So then Roger Wicker from Mississippi would be next in line. He's the most pro Amtrak Republican, by the way. So that bodes interestingly for possible infrastructure or rail bills in the future. And if, if the results stay the way they are in Florida, then ranking member Nelson is most likely to be replaced by Maria Cantwell from Washington State. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll know more in, in the coming days. And now I'm going to turn it over to Rob for the discussion of the transportation ballot measures. Thanks, Chris Jeff. Um, so the in addition to all of the, uh, the the political discussions that Jeff so expertly walked through, there are a lot of measures on the uh, that went before voters to 
uh, pay for or somehow decide things about transportation all across the country. This is something that Eno has been tracking for a number of years um, in kind of different methodologies each time. Uh, just a little bit of context, we think that this year, it, it because it's clear that these measures are becoming more prominent as um, things uh, kind of slow down here in Washington, as city, states, and metropolitan areas start to assert um, more of their own business and trying to get things done. A lot of these measures start to appear on ballots all across the country. We also know that uh, in recent years, the Trump administration has actually favored these kinds of self-help efforts, particularly around raising money. Um, the infrastructure plan actually talked to this and kind of trying to rebalance the federal role and having them uh, support less and having states and local localities uh, pick up more. We know these measures are generally quite popular, about 70% pass from year to year, somewhere around there, a little bit less, a little bit more. Uh, it's important to know that sometimes measures that pass don't always mean good things for transportation, and measures that fail don't mean bad things necessarily. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about those as we go forward. We know these measures cover all modes. Most of these, though, go for local roads and local streets, uh, but we see them from everything from a lot of bicycle and pedestrian measures this year, some maritime, some aviation, so it really covers uh, the whole gamut. These have also been mostly common in the West and the Intermountain West, which have a long history of these places going to the voters and, and, and conducting their own uh, internal processes. But we see these growing all across the country, particularly in the South. The Midwest has a history of them, which I'll talk about in a second. But there was an awful lot of votes um, and an awful lot of measures that appeared before voters uh, in those Southern states this year. And they use all kinds of different revenue raising mechanisms, but mostly sales taxes uh, and property taxes. Those are by far uh, the most common that appeared before voters. There are big news this year. Uh, there were about 95% about of those measures that appeared before voters before November of this year already passed. I'll talk about those in just a second. There were 314 uh, on the ballot yesterday, and they appeared in about 33 states. Most of these are for, as I said, local projects, but there are also a few on the county level, much less on the state and regional level, although the state measures, because of their size and scope, usually get a lot of the attention, and they usually have direct reporting on each of those. It's important to know that in Michigan and Ohio, um, they uh, have a ton of these measures each year. They require certain tax provisions to go before voters that are pretty routine just to allocate money for local roads and streets, things like that. That's often a very small uh, amount of money. There were, even though these were 64% of the total number of measures, um, it was only about 3% of the total money um, generated so far. They're also very popular, about 95% of those pass. So when we go through these measures and we talk about the, the tallies, we usually take out these, uh, these local millages for Ohio and Michigan roads just because they, they, they skew the results a little bit. We do know that there, were more, there was a lot more diversity this year, both in terms of place and source and purpose. As I mentioned, still a lot of uh, emphasis on the Western states, about 40% of the measures appear in the West, but there were 30% in the Midwest and a surprising 24% um, in the South. That, usually, that number was usually around the same as the Northeastern states, about a little less than 10%, but this year, 24%. There were a bunch of measures in places like Georgia and Texas that helped drive that up. Um, it was really interesting that there was almost an even split in terms of the revenue raising mechanism between sales taxes, bonds, and property taxes. It was almost exactly the same. I think there are 50 plus or minus in each of those different categories. We recognize that calling bonds revenue is, is a little dubious because they have to be paid back by some other source, usually a property tax, but that's how they're presented to the voters. So that's why we include it here. There are also a lot of measures um, for a purely advisory nature, this seems to be a growing trend where um, officials are going to the voters and asking them to give them advice on things that they would normally um, ask them to, to uh, raise revenue or other, other kind of questions for. I'll talk about that in a second. And lastly, most of these are, as I said, around um, for road projects, but a big increase this year, um, there were 22% of the total measures were going for transit and 9% um, for bicycle and pedestrian um, projects. A lot of these local streets, local bike paths, things like that. We may have better reporting on it, so we may just know more, but there was an awful lot more of those this year. We also saw bike and ped um, in this category we called secondary modes, where there might have been questions before voters for road and street projects. 
with bicycle and pedestrian amenities, mostly for sidewalks as a secondary purpose. So these results are all still coming in, but I want to give you this, this slide here showing you that there's about $13 billion that voters have considered already this year for transportation um, referenda. There was about $50 billion uh, before voters last night. We don't have numbers yet on these because it's all still kind of coming in, but these are the ones that uh, add up to a lion's share of that. These measures alone would raise about 46 of that total, uh, 46 billion of the total 50 billion. Um, and so these are the ones that a lot of folks have been watching very, very closely. There were two measures in Colorado, both different um, um, ideologies for raising revenue. One focused on sales taxes uh, and, and going to the, and, um, and issuing debt through bonds. One was exclusively focused on bonds and exclusively focused, just as they said, on their damn roads. Um, we also looked at other me measures in places like Washington and Michigan that weren't necessarily about transportation. One was a carbon tax in Washington and one was an excise tax on marijuana sales in Michigan. Neither one of those are transportation specific, but they both would have thrown off a lot of revenue for transportation. Um, Missouri's Proposition D was exclusively uh, fuel tax for transportation. I'll talk about that in just a second. And the big one was in California, which was Proposition 6, which didn't actually raise money by itself, but it retained the gas tax that the legislature passed in recent years. There are also a number of smaller measures on the county level. Um, you can see them listed here in Hillsborough and Broward in Florida, San Mateo and Marin in California, and Collin County in uh, the state of Texas. Those top four uh, all failed. Um, both the Colorado measures failed. I think this was a surprise to a lot of folks that thought that one of them would pass and one would fail, but they both went down. So did the carbon tax uh, issue in Washington and the, uh, the gasoline tax increase in Missouri. The marijuana law, law passed in Michigan and California upheld the, um, the fuel tax that they passed a few years ago. And all of those county measures that I mentioned also passed. Though I think San Mateo was too close to coal. San Mateo may be still too close to call. It required two thirds. You need a two thirds vote in California, and they're 66.1 percent, and I mean 66.6, .6, something like that. So we're going to watch that one very closely. So just some early takeaways from this: um, we we noticed that voters actually face very few user fees to pay directly for transportation. Things like gasoline taxes, vehicle registration fees, tolls. Um, there was even a vehicle miles traveled advisory um, measure that was before voters. So there were very few of those, and those that they did face fared very, very poorly. I think they all failed, every single transportation-related user fee measure, with the exception of California, which just upheld the gasoline tax they already had. We do think that there's a, a greater emphasis on multimodal measures this year, measures that were very broad, focusing on a whole range of different uh, transportation uh, investments, things like transit and bike ped, which by themselves also fared very well, I think, all of the transit measures appear to have passed or, or pretty close to it. Uh, we're getting those stats um, imminently. All those state measures that I said to raise revenue for, um, for transportation fared poorly. But again, it's really important not to read too much into some of the measures where transportation was a secondary concern. Nobody can say that the measure in Michigan was just about transportation. That was a measure about marijuana, even though they called it uh, pot and potholes, something like that. The fact that it passed is probably more of a, a, a an issue around marijuana that is about transportation. Same thing with the carbon tax in, in Washington state and the anti-tax rhetoric that we've seen uh, in a lot of places, particularly in the Intermountain West. So we are gonna continue to, uh, to analyze these measures. There's a whole lot of, of uh, additional research that we need to do. As I said, just because something passed or failed doesn't mean it was good or bad for transportation. But as the team here led by, by Alex and others start to look through um, some of these smaller measures, an enormous um, number of them seem to have passed, which probably is going to raise a lot of revenue for transportation on a much smaller scale. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Um, I know we have a whole bunch of questions that are starting to come in. Uh, let me just start to let me look at one. What, so let me start with one for Jeff here. There's a whole lot of questions around the political side. So one big question, obviously, in and around New York is what all this might mean for the Gateway Project, a big nationally, but probably nationally significant project, the Hudson River. Any thoughts about what that means politically for that project? Um, 
Not as much as you might think, and simply because, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's, you know, you've got Nita Lowy will chair the House Appropriations Committee, and she's from New York and is a big supporter of the project. On the other hand, she's replacing Rodney Freelingheisen from New Jersey, who was also a big, you know, huge supporter of, of that project. Uh, the, the problem with Gateway has always really been in the Senate, in that to whatever extent President Trump believes that he's playing some kind of long game with Chuck Schumer over Gateway as, 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 uh, as leverage for something else or cooperation on a bigger infrastructure bill. I'm not sure. But so, uh, again, the, the amount of money needed is so large that if you try to, there's still no way to fund it really adequately out of the regular budget. So you either got to do it with some kind of, spe, you know, special off the books treatment and some kind of infrastructure bill, or it probably uh, can't get done. There's another, I think maybe then a related question that a bunch of folks are asking that what does all this then mean for an infrastructure bill. We saw a lot of this as the reporting this morning. Folks trying to think, well, maybe this is something where there's some kind of bipartisan agreement. Any thoughts on what this means for us? Uh, Nancy Pelosi, who is presumed to be the, the new speaker, uh, spoke, you know, said a lot ago that, that infrastructure is going to be one of their top priorities when they take over the House in January. I'm told that Peter DeFazio, who was having a, a conference call when I was in the car on the way here, uh, said that he believes that President Trump, Trump really wants to, a a good is going to make good faith negotiations on an infrastructure bill. So everyone's making the the, the everyone's uh, saying the, the the right things. But when you get down to it, you're probably going to have to pay for it. The the the, the new deficit forecasts are getting so bad that the the, the days of just uh, adding a trillion dollars here and a trillion dollars there to the deficit are probably coming to an end. Just as the Democrats are ready to take the House, and if you got to pay for it, it's hard for me to imagine the Democratic leaders taking over the House as putting any pay for in any major bill that don't involve walking back some of the Republican tax cuts that were made a year and some ago. And to the extent that President Trump feels invested in those tax cuts, the way that President Obama felt invested in the Health Care Act that, that wound up bearing his name, kind of, uh, it's really hard to see how you get to substantive legislation uh, it's got to be paid for if you can't have basic agreement on how to on on whether the pay for should come from user taxes, which again there, there's no there's still no in, in, in no uh, statement from the Democratic leadership that they would back a gas tax increase. They've been very uh, circumspect on that, but you know the, the user taxes in general, as opposed to repealing some of the tax cuts for wealthy individuals and corporations that were part of that tax bill a year ago, uh, I, I'm not sure how you get past that early on and. Other, and in, in another word, you're going to have to do a, a pro, another two-year appropriations budget deal before then. The appropriators always say the traffic and HUD bill is the real infrastructure bill, not anything the authorizing committees would do. So we're probably going to have to go through that process before you get to the point of talking about an infrastructure bill. A relate, perhaps then a related couple of questions here. Um, folks seem to, to pick up on this point that these, the user fees on the federal and state level and possibly on the local level – um, so I've seen to be unpopular, at least before the voters and, and apparently here on the federal level. So, I mean, any ideas how we would pay for infrastructure and transportation in the future, maybe related to the appropriations discussion? Um, well, the the president's trillion or 1.5 trillion, however you wanted to say it, plan was largely based on leverage because, and, and the federal level, leverage funding doesn't largely doesn't count towards the deficit. You know, if, if I loan you a billion dollars for your to the TIPIA program or the RIF program, the federal deficit doesn't go up. You know, federal spending records don't go up by a billion dollars. They go up by five or six percent of that if it's a well-run program. So, but the problem is that we just saw again that the TIPIA program, another once again, only used less than half of the money available to it to make loans because there aren't enough projects that have revenue streams to repay all of these. Project. So doing it via leverage like the administration had proposed is probably not a real winner, although it might work for Gateway. You, you might be able to do it for that, but not many other uh, projects. Yeah, um, right. There's still no groundswell on either party for a significant increase in the gasoline and diesel taxes. And just to tread water and, and keep funding the fast act spending levels, you need a 12 cent increase immediately. Uh, and then if you want program growth after that, you know, there, there, there's no appetite for that. So. I honestly don't know how, you know, it, it may wind up being like the Fast Act. They just, you know, raid the couch cushions for enough odds and ends to buy you a few more years of funding and just use that for uh, as, as the fund for whatever they're going to spend it on.
So a, folk, a couple of folks were asking then about some kind of top line takeaways on the ballot measure side. I think um, it is kind of a it, it is closer to a mixed bag um, than than anything else because some of the larger measures, the ones that had a lot of attention and would have raised an awful lot of money, actually went down. But uh, again, as Alex Laska here and, and Sojun Kim and a couple of others are starting to plow through these hundreds and hundreds of other measures, these smaller ones seem to pass, and so they don't usually get a lot of attention. Um, and so we're going to continue to focus on some of the deep, the deeper stories in those uh, smaller measures because, uh, again, there's a lot of reporting on the big ones, the gas tax in, in Missouri and the measures in Colorado, but there's an awful lot of measures that have their own stories that we're just getting ready to dig into. Um, someone asked about the VMT measure. There was a very small countywide measure in DuPage County, Illinois, where they were being, voters, they were being asked whether or not the county should oppose the state's plan to, oppose, uh, to pursue a vehicle miles traveled charge. That's all we know about what went into that, and that one um, failed pretty resoundingly. Um, in terms of how much money was raised for, um, for, you know, for the campaign for these amendments, it's hard to say. Some of the very big ones, for instance, the carbon tax in Washington State drew an awful lot of money, particularly from outside of Washington State in opposition. Uh, the California measure to repeal the gas tax obviously um, had a lot of money associated with it, and they raised a lot of money. But uh, the the smaller measures, particularly the local ones, are generally not. There is no campaign around them at all. They are sometimes often very routine, and they just appear before voters um, in a very um, kind of just just normal way. But, but you know, and it's the way that they raise money in these places. So usually, no campaign around those at all or or whatsoever. Um, any other, let me, uh, Jeff, let me end one more with you then. So, um, do we think, is there any transportation hubris that we can invoke here and say that that had any role in anything that happened yesterday on the political side for any of the votes? Maybe it drew more people out in California or in Missouri or anything like that. Anything purely speculation, but what do you think? Um, I haven't gone through the county and regional numbers on props on prop six in california but i'm told the whole reason that prop six was put on the ballot was to try to draw out the vote to protect republican incumbents in orange county and san diego in that area and i think some of them may have skated by so we'll have to wait another day uh so even though because even though the, the measure failed statewide it may have been stronger in some areas so that uh you can't really draw much of a conclusion from that uh, but you know unfortunately you saw a lot of uh, members with strong uh, transportation records either retiring, you know, because you know, like, like Lobiondo in New Jersey uh, retired. He had a great infrastructure record, but he's one of those members that, like, like Rodney Freelingheisen, uh, that tax bill was going to kill him. So he retired to get ahead of that because so many of his constituents were going to be going to have their, uh, you, know, you know, middle and you know, middle and upper middle class people were going to have their their uh, their tax returns destroyed because of that. So I think. Uh, Unfortunately, there were a lot of uh, other things that were on voters' minds in a lot of these races ahead of infrastructure. Yeah. That was our transportation hubris. I didn't know if we could do more <laughs> for that. But, but clearly, as far as these measures go, there's an awful lot of interest, at least for getting these in front of voters. And as I said, we expect that this trend uh, is only going to intensify. Um, I want to apologize to folks for the uh, audio problems. We're going to try to work on that um, in the future. We are going to post these slides. And a lot of folks had asked a bunch of questions about um, the database for the ballot measures. That is available now on our website, www.enotrans.org. Um, we are going to continually try to update that with the, uh, the database is up there now, and we're going to continue to update that as, the res as these results come in um, and we find some reporting on that. But I want to thank you all very much for your participation. If you would like any more information uh, about Eno, you can go to our website, as I said, www.enotrans.org. Dot org, and I want to encourage you to subscribe to Eno Transportation Weekly uh, that Jeff edits, and it's a really an invaluable resource on all aspects of transportation in addition to all things that we discussed here today. Uh, with that, I want to thank you all very much for your participation. Have a great afternoon.